real. <laughs> How do we help an orphan? Wow. We've seen some perplexing, or I hope some somewhat convicting, thoughts, mannerisms, opportunities, and maybe we say, or we sit back and we, you know, pat ourselves on the back, oh, she, she recognized that, that we helped her last year, and they're still orphans, loved ones. They're still orphans. How do we help them? First and foremost, I think the greatest help that we become is when we recognize that I was. That I was. That I was an orphan. Clay, I remember my, both my parents still. I was an orphan. Amen. I was separated from my father Amen. at birth by sin. Amen. I stayed separated as long as I chose to say separated. But I, I was an orphan. <laughs> I think the very first thing that we can do to help orphans is to recognize that I was. Because loved ones, until we get to the place where we recognize that we were and we're restored back to the correct relationship with our Father, then our heart might moan for, for, for an orphan. At 2 o'clock in the morning when we're eating our bonbons or Oreos, double dip stuff, whichever ones are your favorite, and we see it come on television and there's some pictures that move us to, to maybe do something. Or we come to church and we see something and we're moved to maybe do something by the image. That's the person who hasn't recognized that I was. Because loved ones, the very second that you recognize and you can relate to the fact that I, I was an orphan, then orphans become something endearing. The orphans of the world. Now, not, not only the physically departed, the physically separated, the physically ones that don't have parents, but the spiritually ones that we recognize that, that are still living in a spiritual orphanage, so to speak, because they haven't recognized their Father who is in heaven. And to this we might say, why God? Why, why is there orphans? Why is there a circumstance? Why? I mean, short answer is, so that we can help. It's an opportunity. Why are there orphans? So, so we can participate. So that we can help. So that we can be a part of. Oh, why does it end up that way? It doesn't end up that way if we do our part. Well, then why, did, why, why aren't we doing our part? Becomes the question. And then it becomes a more issue that, that kind of buries us down. And, and we've talked over the, the past few months and weeks, of course. And we, we have these statements that resound in our minds that it's possible to to grow up in the garden and not be part of the vine. It's, it's possible to believe that we believe, but not truly believe. And we, we have all those things that kind of swarm around us here lately because I believe that we have to get to a place where we recognize that I was. Because when we get to the place of looking at that recognition and, and, and seeing ourselves, not someone else's sin, not someone else's circumstance, but one-on-one -on -one with God, looking in His reflecting mirror back at ourselves and we say... I was, but, but God, why then? Why did you create me? Why did you even create to begin with? And that's where we're going in our message today. We're going all the way back to Genesis. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. To try to get why. Why God created. Period. Why did a self-existent, not created being create? For what purpose? Did he create? Starts off with the things of the earth. Why? Why? Why create the things of the earth? The sun, the moon, the, the expanses, the sky, the stuff that's put into to Genesis chapter 1 in the creation experience. Why create all of that? And then it moves on to us. Why create the very parasite? Amen? That's going to, to in fact, have to pin your son to the cross for their own redemption. Why create that parasite? Why create that thing that's going to latch on to you and need? And I believe we'll find the purpose in all of those things. 
And that will, and that I pray that that, that what we'll recognize within that on this this orphan Sunday that, we're, that, that that within that when we recognize that I was an orphan and we recognize that our Father God created us for a purpose, that we'll then have the heart that He has to reach out and to be with the orphan, to be a part of the process, to see these things as not overwhelming. You know, those statistics, they're, they're very overwhelming. The numbers that are out there are very overwhelming until we could take one person's wealth in the entire world. One! Now, it doesn't even have to be the richest man. It could be like the 50th down the line. Just one, one man, one, one individual, one person, his wealth could negate all those numbers. One person. And, and, and it's a dollar. It's a dollar bill. It's a, or, or translated a, a yen or or euro or whatever. Whatever. It's that that keeps them from being helped. Mm -hmm. Finances. <laughs> I mean, at the core of it is truly desire, will, wanting to, and help. But but when we translate it, 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 it has to do with paper, right? Mm -hmm. And when we translate paper, that all comes down to ooh, shiny. Right? In, in, in its true form. At some point in time, some Neanderthal, some whatever your philosophy is on that, some man, some guy with a thought process was raking up some dirt and said, Ooh, pretty. <laughs> and gave value to something that now we value everything based upon. How primitive is that? Ooh. Pretty. But we've evolved so much. <laughs> we've gotten so far when it's just a, a, a dollar that that's the difference. No, loved ones, I believe that the difference is, is the heart of the situation. What do we truly value? You see, in our culture, you've heard me say before, I, I do believe that we know just about the cost of everything. We know the value of very little. We have value systems that, that have been totally skewed and totally messed up through our culture because it's this immediate thing that I want something now. You see, a value of something is recognizing that it takes time to build, it takes time to get, it takes time to harvest. You don't just go down to Walmart and grab a bag of apples. You have to actually prepare the land and plant something and do all those processes that we've got into this fast-paced world where we think it's me, 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 and I can get whatever I want. And, and you see, we're raising a culture of, of children that can look at a, a sheet from Walmart that's a hundred count and you know I'm a man y'all don't think I know about this stuff but I'm gonna <laughs> drop some knowledge on you you know we look at that hundred count sheet and it's blue and we say that one's five dollars and there's a five hundred count sheet over here that's a hundred dollars they're both blue sheets what's the difference <laughs> you think a man did that did <laughs> the difference is do you want to wake up blue or not <laughs> value in anything. It's like if, if this thing can mimic, amen? If this thing can counterfeit or look something like what the truth is, then I'll accept it because by the first appearance it, it looks to be the same. Oh, now you're getting to the message, Clay. Yeah. The problem is, is us in the church, we've accepted the hundred count sheet a lot of times. And we're blue all over. We walk around our culture blue all over, but we've never said I was. I was an orphan. I've never recognized the value of a true relationship with God. Therefore, I, I still hold on to what? Ooh, pretty. When it comes to a true need. A true need. A true need. We what we pull up to the gas station, what? Oh my God! Is it really $3.67? A gallon? This is crazy. This is robbery. And we're filling it right on up. This is crazy. <laughs> and then we pull it out. We pull in the Starbucks. And I'll have a mocha latte fag. It's skinny, shaking, not stirred. That'll be $7.95. Okay? Do the math. 14 ounces of drink. How much is that a gallon? <laughs> but we don't complain to Starbucks. Amen? <laughs> 
Our value system. Our value system. And believe me, gas is way too expensive. And some of you have never been to Starbucks. But, That's right. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to, to be real with you for a second. The things that we want, the things that we want to do, the ooh pretties of this world, we found a way to do it. Amen? And we'll still fill up our car if it's $10 a gallon. We will. So when we look at this dynamic and we talk about creation, what I want us to get the understanding of is this, this father, this father figure that we're going to recognize as we finally come to the, to the agreement. And again, I, you know, maybe there's someone today that will for the first time say, I'm an orphan and I no longer want to be. Maybe there's some, some of us out here that will finally make that connection and say, you know what, as I look at this scenario and as I evaluate it, that's exactly my experience. That's exactly where I'm at. I've never made that connection before, but, but I was. I was. I was departed from my Father, my Heavenly Father, and I did accept what He had to offer. And He did bring me back through adoption process through, through Jesus Christ that we'll look at today. And, and, and maybe, maybe that, that, that I'll have that connection then, and then we can look forward to an orphan Sunday where, where we are the bride of Christ and they are our responsibility. Amen. And we can help. Guess what? Even this group can help more than that one village. Amen. Amen. What? Yeah, absolutely. One person's doing it on our behalf. <coughs> so let's look in Genesis. We're not going to read it all for the sake of time. But I think that some, the most of us have been in church long enough that, that we've gone through the creation experience or we've heard and, and we'll get the highlights for sure. And you can go back and read it. It's, it's pretty, pretty good stuff, especially some of the high points that we'll point out today that maybe, maybe you've never really looked at before. You know, it starts out with our understanding of God and the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. If there was an us in the creation, we have to understand the us, Right? Because when God, after God created all the things, He said, let us create man in our own image. He gave it us. So, so we don't want to just bleed by that and, and, and run, run on past and, and say, what is the us? What is that dynamic? What is that situation? Well, we want to have an understanding of that because that's what the Bible says. The Bible uses a pluralistic statement when it talks about forming man. And if we're going to say, why God? Why you create me? Why am I alive? We must go back to that initial thing, right? Because man kind of created himself, so to speak, through procreation after the initial creation, right? Mm -hmm. So there was an initial creation, and we want to look at that initial creation to get the why of God, because beyond that, man's kind of procreated. Man doesn't create himself, he procreates. He takes what's already there and then uses it because God designed us that way to be able to procreate. So we want to make sure that if there's an us, is there the participants of the Trinity in that, in that opening statement, in, in this opening creation? Well, we see in verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we certainly can, can relate to in that opening statement without digging any further that there was God and then there's the Spirit of God. Right? Those two participants, the, the Father and the Holy Spirit, were there because we see the Spirit and we do see God. Now, when he opens up and it says, and God said, if we're going to communicate anything, whether it be in our language or any other language, we're going to use what? Words. Words. So when God said, we pick up in chapter 1 of John, where the Word was God, was with God. Okay, so... All of our Sunday school lessons, hopefully we're moving along the same pace. If, if not, write down John chapter 1 and read John chapter 1. And it will help us to understand this, this, and God said. And if God said, he's going to use the words. Because God didn't have to say anything. Do you get that? God could have just... Yeah. Right? Okay, so if he's the creator of all and he's this almighty power, then the spirit was hovering, then the spirit could have went through and without saying anything, but we see that he said because the three participants are there. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. All three of them. Now we've broken this down on Wednesday nights 
and some other studies and everything else, and this is certainly just a quick view of what that looks like as far as the Trinity when it comes to our understanding of their participation in the Godhead. Okay, and, and this is something that we're trying in our finite minds to understand an infinite being. So is it going to explain everything? No, but I believe it gets us on the right track. I believe if we look at God the Father as the planner, the planner, he's the ultimate planner. He has this ultimate plan that he's going to work out throughout. So if we're going to say why to God, why did you create? We're going to be really speaking to the planner. We get that? We're going to be asking that question of the, the planner. But, but there's a great portion of that question that's answered in the plan. Jesus Christ, we have the Father, the Son. The Son is the plan. The planner, the plan. There's great revelation in what the plan is to help us understand why God created us. But the problem is, is too often we're blocked off to that, especially before regeneration, before accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We're blinded to some of those truths. Mm -hmm. Most of those truths truths. So then we have the, the work of the Holy Spirit, which is the revealer of the plan. Okay? So it gets us, I believe, it's again, it's a quick view of, and we, we could certainly study it more on Wednesday nights and have gone more in depthly, but just to get us on the right page as we move forward, we have the planner, the plan in Jesus Christ, and the revealer of the plan in the Holy Spirit. Because there's nothing that you've understood and accepted about God without the involvement of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Okay? How do we receive Jesus? We've looked at that back at Christmas last year, I believe. How do you receive Jesus? The same way Mary received her. Received Him. And how does she receive Him? The Spirit of God. Right? Hovering much like He's hovering here. Okay? So we receive Jesus the same way that Jesus has always been received, through the Spirit. By that revelation. And again, we could go weeks into that study. But we're on the right track, I hope. The planner <laughs> is who we're requesting from why God, why create. We see a lot of his answers in the plan as revealed by the Holy Spirit. So we see chap chapter 1, verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, verse 14, verse 20, verse 24. There's this statement, this rhetorical statement that's going, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. You see, He created all these things, and we, we see in this experience that He created light, He created the separation of the day and the night, He created the land, the waters, the land to rise up out of the waters, the animals to walk across the seas, and to come out of the seas, and to walk on dry land. All this creation, we might say at the end of that, again, why God create all of this stuff? And the beauty is in the answer of because you need it. Because I, because, because I need it. God created everything that human needed before he even created the human. All the world, all the land, all the things that we walk around and inhabit and, and have dominion over and the ooh pretty that controls our lives. All those things were created in essence by God to begin with so that we had a place, a sustenance. So all that we need physically was created before we even came in. But the beauty of this and God said and God said is, is that in our English language sometimes we miss some of the, the truths of the scripture because it just uses this word God and then we might miss over that or, or just look over in chapter 2 when man's being created that that there's a Lord God, not just a God. And I promise we're going to bring all this in. This is a whole lot of facts that we have to get to get to the core of what the message is this morning. Because I don't want us to be ignorant in our approach. And sometimes some of these things, though they're revealing, they're not quite as exciting as some of the truths that will be revealed later in the message. <clears throat> so we have this, and God said, and God said, and God said. Well, if we understand the translation, God, this word, and God said, and God said, is Elohim. It's Elohim. Elohim is creator. Elohim is, is this magical power, this, this, this beyond, not pre-existent, doesn't have an existence, never has a starting or a beginning or an end, doesn't have any of those things. He is simply the creator. 
the creator of it all. And what we do is we recognize that no matter where you're from, no matter what culture there has been found in the deepest, darkest tribes of Cambodia or anything else, that they all recognize what? A supreme being. Right. They all recognize, whether it be by totem pole, by rings in their nose, by stretching their necks, by whatever the dynamic is, all those purposes were because they recognize the supreme being. They recognize this, this Elohim. This Elohim. Loved ones, Elohim is not Allah. Right. Though there is only one, Elohim is a recognition of a supreme being. And the reason that he wasn't recognized as Lord God, which Lord God translates to Jehovah or Yahweh, is a different word because there's a different understanding of God. Yahweh or Jehovah, Jehovah is my provider. My provider. Yahweh is personal God, God that I can have a relationship with. You see, the very beauty of the scripture is that God wasn't a personal being until there was something to be personal with. You see that beauty in that transition? Creator, 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 created all this thing. Now we're getting to the message. Now you can wake back up and listen. So when we get to this place, we have God kind of participating in the creation this God the Father, this the, the Elohim, almost off into the to the side and, 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 and not present, so to speak. It's just he said. Do you get this? He said. And he said. And he said. But when it came to man, when it came to the creation of man, he steps out of this ambiguance. He steps out of the darkness, so to speak, and instead of just using his voice, what do we see in man? That it comes down on to this thing that he spoke into existence and starts to gather up those things. Now, God could have said, Let there be Adam. And guess what? There would have been Adam. But there's something different about the way he spoke everything into creation all the animals, all the things, and then the way he created man. There's a difference between that. And we have to get that because, because aside from that, we have what we have in our culture where there's almost this worship of animals, worship of property, worship of, of land, as if they're not as viable as the human. God separated the human being from all of those other things. Now, does it mean that we disrespect animals, disrespect the land? Dis no, He gave those things to our care. But by no means are the animals or the trees of the field equals... To us in God's eyes. Don't miss that. It became very personal to God. He came down and, so, so to speak, got his hands dirty when it came to creating man. He came down and he started to form this stuff. He moved this, and, he, and let's make it in our image. And there's this molding and making. But there's no life. There's no life. There's just this molding and this making. Now, we understand we've all had that person, right, in, in, in our relationships or in our time that has a um, personal space problem. Anybody? That doesn't understand personal space? That person who's like, right? Am I, am I speaking? Are y'all awake? We, we've all, I know, I know we're in church and we don't like to think about that person right now, but... We've all had that person that was like, <laughs> right? And then we're like, whoa, man, there, there's something about, there's something about personal space. And, and why is it that way? Amanda, come here. Sean, come here. Uh -oh. You thought she was going to fall asleep. <laughs> you know, the, the, I like to think that God, in his relationship with man, he forms this, this, thing, and it says he breathed life into it. Now, if I come up to my wife and I do, there's nothing spooky about that, but <laughs> we, we get in the picture? There's something about it. <laughs> there is something about personal space that, that what? 
has something to do with intimacy. Proximity has something to do with intimacy. Wouldn't we agree? Okay, so intimacy says that the closer you are, the more intimate I am with you. The more intimate I can be with you by proximity. We understand that. Let's even do it from, from a different point so we don't scare you to death anymore. <laughs> is we understand that, that distance is about like that. We're okay with that, right? We can have a conversation with somebody like that. But we, but we don't have a conversation with, Hey, Maxie, how you doing? <laughs> And then she's, oh, I'm doing fine. Oh, that's great. How's your mom and them? <laughs> we do understand that there needs to be a closeness, right? But there is, there is proximity issues when it comes. But what we see about God, the beauty of this, and what I want us to get about this, is that he comes down, forms. So when this, when this man who had never drawn air before, who had never seen anything, opens his eyes for the very first time what he sees. Why create us? Closeness, personal relationship, intimacy, <coughs> intimacy. And then the first thing that man sees is the holy presence, the complete unit. Let's create him in our own image. Not God said, God said, God said, God said, God formed and created. So there's something about us and intimacy. And intimacy meaning proximity to God, right? It doesn't get much more intimate than that. There's a short list, loved ones, of people that I want to... No, let's get it. There's a short list, loved ones, of people that I would even think about. And they all share my blood. Or my name. There's something about that, that close, personal intimacy. And that's what God the Father says. Now, you have no problem with your baby or even someone else's baby. Right? All up in their face. Amen? Amen. Uh, no, no problem with that intimacy when it comes to the innocence of a child. When it comes, and that's what God's saying in that orphan situation is, is Closeness, proximity is a necessity. That's why I created you. I created you to be intimately involved with me, face-to-face -face interaction with me. And from that face-to-face -face interaction with me, be able to pass that on to others so that they can get face-to-face -face with God. You were created to be with God. He does that. He create, why create man? Why create all the things for man? Okay, well, okay, if he created all the things for man, then why create man? To be with him. Amen. To be with him. He created us so that we could be with him. His plan was for us to be with him. Now, did they mess up the plan by sinning? No. They completed the plan. They can, because the beauty of it is that God created man and he, he stuck out his hand. And then the first man, he had his hand out. Guess what God still does? God hasn't changed, not one ounce. God still got the same hand, the same resolve, the same situation as he had for Adam. Is the hand is stuck out. The problem is, is that man, even in and of himself, Given the freedom which love requires, right? right? Given the freedom that love requires, would never ever reach out and take God's hand. Even when God, him, and his wife were the only ones present. Man could never do that. God, God knew that before he created man. And what's beautiful is that, is that the scene changes because God's got his hand out like this. And what he says is my plan, my plan is... To become man. And I'm going to reach out and grab the hand of God from the other side. 
To make the connection for man forever. For always. That's my plan. My plan is to extend the hand that I know they won't grab. And then they come like them and grab the hand that I knew they would never grab so that they can, in essence, through him, be with me. Amen. She's going to bear a son. His name will be called Jesus. Emmanuel, which means with us. With me. Why did God create man? To be with him. To be with him. Why did Jesus have to die so God could be with him? Why did Jesus come to earth? God with us. God wants to be right there. And loved ones, I'm going to tell you, with sin in your life, right there is extremely uncomfortable. Yeah. Amen. 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 That was sin you was running from, brother. <laughs> it's uncomfortable because we know. Why? And then it's the same dynamic. What happened to Adam and Eve when they first sinned is they felt fear of God. They felt not, not what God intended. God hadn't changed. God was still walking in the garden. He was still presenting himself like he always had. Matter of fact, I believe that God, we talked about this a little bit Wednesday night, I believe that God was coming into the garden to give the good news. You've sinned and I knew you would. But I've got a plan. But I've got a plan. What does he say? I'm going to put a midi between your seed and her seed. Whose seed? The virgin seed. Her seed. Her seed. He's going to crush your head. But you're going to cause him, you're going to inflict pain. You're going to strike his heel. But the ultimate and irreversible victory was won way back in Genesis. Amen. Let's read it. So you don't think I'm just going into some Sunday school fairy tale. Chapter 3, verse 5. Cursed are you above livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Between your offspring and hers. Now, loved ones, it doesn't take a whole lot of historical research to understand that when a man and a woman gets married, whose name's passed on? Yes. How is lineage looked at? The man. This totally throws that on its head. Why? Because Jesus wasn't born of man. That's why he spoke to the woman. That's the beautiful perfection of the scripture. The big word for it, proto-evangelium. It's the initial announcement of the gospel. God's plan. God had a plan before he created us to restore us because restoring us was his masterpiece, not in creating us. Did you get that? No, that was pretty quick. His ultimate plan was not creating us, it was restoring us. It was showing us his love. It was becoming the sacrifice for us. Not a backup plan. Not I gave them everything that they wanted and look what happened. I gave them everything that they needed and look at them. You know, too often we look at God that way. I believe God rushed out into the garden after their sin and say, I like it when a plan works out. I've got a plan beyond this. I knew that was going to happen. But yet what happened is they thought, they thought, and this is what keeps us apart from God, is they thought that the guilt that they felt was a reflection of, of God's feelings towards them. Do you get that? They thought that the guilt, that the, the nakedness, the shame that they felt was a reflection of God's feelings towards them. And the truth was is they had created a God that did not exist. Because even though God knew they had sinned, He did what? Saw them out in the garden. Just like he always did. Just like always. Just like always. God had not changed. Their perception of God had changed because of their sin. And if you're allowing guilt, riddenness, and, and sinfulness to keep you away from God, it's because you've created in your mind a God that does not exist. Now God must judge sin. There's no question about that. 
But how is it that he can still love you? Because he never stopped loving you. His hand is constantly extended. And he said, my plan, because I knew you wouldn't, wasn't for you to ever reach out and grab my hand to begin with. My plan is to become that. And to reach out and make the connection myself so that you can therefore come and live with me for eternity. That's why he calls the regenerate soul his masterpiece. Not his creation. He doesn't go back and say, you know, I created a good thing. And it was very good. He did say it was very good. He didn't say it was his masterpiece. His masterpiece is us. Covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Accepting his plan by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And saying, thank you. Thank you, I believe you. And I won't let sin create in me a shame that doesn't exist. Because there is what? No condemnation for those. Amen? Oh, it all works together. It all comes together. And the beauty of all of it. But let's work on this, this other thought real quick. The God that they had created is prevalent in our culture. That judgmental, zap you down, beat you down, God. Now, Clay, I hear you. Don't, don't get to that place where you're just preaching a good, warm, fuzzy, feel-good message. You, it, it is warm and fuzzy to know that Jesus Christ died for my sins. It is warm and fuzzy to know that God wants personal intimacy with me. It is one. Those things are real and they are true. They take action on my part. But that God that's out there that keeps people at a distance, that they think they allow their shame to be equivalent to how God feels about them, that they've created a God that does not exist, I will preach against that too because it's a lie. God loves you because He is love. How do we get that? What, how, did, how did they act about it? Let's, let, let's, let's see their actions. Did they act like what God said was you don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? You don't eat of the tree in the middle of the garden because it's going to give you that knowledge. And you will surely die. But they responded as if he said, I'll kill you. You get the difference? You get the difference? What's the difference? Yep. My shame equated to God's word. He said you will surely die. And that's a fact. That's what happens to us in sin. But it's not that God kills us. He didn't say I'll, I'll kill you. And they were scared of him because why? He's going to kill me. People scared of judgment because he's going to kill me. Well, maybe not to the level of kill me. He's going to judge me. He's going to want me to do something different than I want to do. No, loved ones, I'm here to tell you, you come face to face with God, He's going to make you want the things that He wants. He's going to change you. You're not going to change yourself. If you could have reached out, there would have been no reason for Him to come and make the connection. You reaching out in your own power was never part of the plan. We're in the beginning. It's not there. You doing it, you being capable of doing it, it's not even a part of the plan. But yet we spend our whole lives doing that, right? I need to quit this so that I can do, I need to stop this so that I can do, and I need to constantly trying to better ourselves or, or shape shift ourselves into, I mean, instead of saying, you know what, I can't, but I deeply desire to be with you, God. Come down and get ooh, in my face. Cleanse. Whatever separates that from being comfortable. If you won't come face to face with God, it's not because of His judgment, it's because of your sin. I hope we get that. Let's make, we'll wind this up, because we're going to do communion also. Which I think is a vital part of recognizing being with God. Fellowship, communion, a meal.
I mean, the temple. The temple was set up what? With a barbecue out front and a restaurant in the middle. Amen? Table of show bread, food going on, constant smell of barbecue out front, right? Amen. You like, you like that temple, right? Oh, the sanctuary. <laughs> but that's the reality. There's something about fellowship and communion with one another and having a meal together that has a closeness. Now, we've lost that a lot of times in our families, in our fast-paced world, that time to sit around and just have fellowship with one another. But even in the Ten Commandments, we recognize, now, as we've talked about these dynamics, we recognize that affections is certainly a part of a relationship, right? And closeness, proximity, this affection. And to meet closeness and, and, and together, this face-to-face this -face thing, it, it takes an act of the, of the body, the flesh, you have affections that are emotion. You have body that's flesh. You have words, right? We have words that we want to speak. We speak different words about those we're affectionate with, right? Than just the general public. Is that my crazy? No way. We speak different words about that, right? And then we spend time with. So we recognize what affections, body, words, time, right? Affections, body, words, time. They have to do with relationship. Let's look at the Ten Commandments. It's in Exodus chapter 20 if you want to flip there, or you can just listen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Affection? Anybody? Am I crazy? Affection? I'm to be esteemed above all others. Affection? You shall make for yourself, and you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything, heaven above or on the earth, beneath their waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for their sin and parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commands. Still see the affection? No other gods before me. That's the first commandment. Affection. Affection. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord, your God, or the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So we see affections, we see the body in, in not making an image or graven image. We see these words with not using, misusing the name, not vocabulary, not, not to misuse. And then he talks about time when he says, remember the Sabbath day and it's holy. So he's saying, in the, even in the commandments, there's an outline of your affections, your physical body. The words that you use and the time that you spend. A am I going out on a limb? So even in those commands, those first four commands deal with your relationship with God. The rest of them deal with your relationship with each other. But first and foremost, we have to have our relationship with God. We must have affection to God. We must surrender our body to God. We must allow our words to be used by God. And the only way that we can do that is by spending time. God, because we spend time with those that we love, with those that we hold in esteem. We spend time with them. Now we've made a connection where we agree that this closeness, this proximity, this face-to-face, -face, right? Let me see you face-to-face. -face. This face-to-face -face interaction has to do with, with me, that we were created. Do we get that summation out of, out of Genesis and what we talked about? There's this with me persona. Uh, do we get that? And then as we move past that, that with me in Genesis, we fast forward it to Emmanuel, right? With us. So there's kind of a strand. There's kind of a connection. 
And Clay, if you could give me something out of Revelations, then I'd believe this whole story. Okay. <laughs> Revelations chapter 23. If you get there, then you have a Bible that's wrong. There is no 23. <laughs> Let's figure out a trick. Chapter 21, verse 3. I'll just see if y'all's really turning, if y'all just I wish you'd get done with this. <laughs> let's just let's start starting 21. It says, Then I saw the new heaven and the new earth. The new, the new, what's going to happen at the end, right? right. The place that we long for? Right. <coughs> well, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now, depending on what translation you have, it's either among or with. God's dwelling place is now with the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. His ultimate plan at the very end is to be with us. Now as we come to celebrate, if I could get our ushers to come on down forward so we can went a little longer than wanted to, but this fellowship is important. And, and, and as a fact, you know, let, let's, let's try to move forward if we can um, to make this a little quicker uh, so we're not going all out. But this fellowship that we talk about, this being with God, Christ before His crucifixion broke bread with the disciples. And he went to the disciples and he communicated to them that this is my body that's been broken for you. This is, this is my blood drink of it. He communicated those things to the people. And he said, do this as often as you will in remembrance of me until I return to be with, 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 for all eternity. Now, now the thing, the stipulations within that, and I want to make sure that there's that caution because there's a reality of it. Because there was one amongst them that partook of this. And the scripture even says that if we partake of the meal, of the sacrament, and we're not believers, that we heap judgment upon ourselves. Now, I don't believe you're heaping any more judgment upon yourself than you already have. Because quite honestly, without Jesus Christ... Judgment is heaped upon you. But we do see that separation in Jesus' time. What? With who? With Judas. Okay? As Judas partook of it, what? He was then filled, judgment, and went off and did what he was supposed to do. So there is an importance in that, that you recognize Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That you recognize His desire to be with you. And that we celebrate this time and this communion with one another out of that heart. To be with Him. To do this as often as we will in remembrance of Him until He comes to be with us. I think being with us is pretty important. Matter of fact, I think it was His ultimate plan. And He's been working that plan out for each and every one of us since the first hair sprouted on our head. And, and honestly, even before, his plan was illustrated and instrument in the beginning. At the very beginning, when sin came in, he shows us the way to be with him. If in some way, some shape, some form this morning, God's working in your heart to say, you're not with me. You haven't gotten that close proximity because sin has made you run the other direction. And the reason you run the other direction is because your guilt is being misconstrued. <coughs> you're making the assumption that your sin 
has put God against you. No, loved one. It's your non-acceptance of God that makes you feel God is against you. He wants to get face to face with you this morning. And we want to give you that opportunity too. So we're going to partake of, and we're going to have a closing song. And as we have a closing song, if you feel led to, to come down to commit or recommit, or whatever that be, then I pray that you do that. And we'll play as we hand this out.